Hello, and welcome to the Seattle interview series. On this 15th episode, I have Seattle Reign defender Amber Brooks, two-time NCAA national champion, Nike athlete, NWSL veteran. Thank you for coming on. How have uh, things been for you in uh, training so far this year? Thanks, Ray. Um, training's been going really well. It's obviously the longest preseason in, in league history. So, um, you know, it's definitely nice given the fact that last year was just such a bizarre season and there's obviously, you know, more protocols and things that we're having to follow given COVID still. So um, it's been nice, but it's definitely at the point where we're like, okay, let's get going. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. It's interesting to see that just, you know, I'm sure an extended training period could be nice and could have its pros, but also I'm sure it's just like, okay, let's, let's, let's go already. Um, I want to start early on. How much influence did your parents have on your career as a whole? And how did they, you know, I guess, did they start things off or how, how much influence have they had on your career? Uh, they had a ton, both of them. Um, they both played in college. So my dad played at Lemoyne and my mom played at Ashland. Um, both small schools, but um, they had just passed Title IX in 1976 and they didn't have a women's team. So they actually had to let my mom uh, train and play with the men's team. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, and then I have two older brothers. They're 10 and seven years older than me. So I was supposed to that just want to do everything they were doing and soccer was one of their sports I was like the ball girl at their high school games and just started from a very young age I was about four years old um and so yeah pretty much my entire family uh has had a big influence on on my soccer career from early stage you mentioned that they went to sort of smaller schools how did you end up at North Carolina how did that sort of all fall into place and then how was your time there uh, I mean I think you know, geez, back, I guess I could say when I was going through the recruiting process, um, you know, UNC was still that, like, if you wanted to be a professional soccer player, you wanted to be on the women's national team, like UNC was kind of your sure bet uh, for in terms of winning championships and, and being, you know, on the best college team in the nation. So um, I really did do all like my homework and research and I visited tons of schools. Like it wasn't like, oh, UNC is recruiting me. I'm definitely going there. Like I definitely looked everywhere else um and then when it came down to it um I was just like Amber like you're gonna regret if you had this opportunity to go play at UNC with the caliber of players and coaching staff and I genuinely love the school as well I love the location the academic side of it and I thought like worst case scenario if for some reason I wake up and hate soccer or I have a career ending injury like this is still a college that I want to be at so um it ended up being definitely one of the best decisions I've ever made, certainly for having been at such a young age, you know, 16 years old, making that decision. I think it's even younger these days, which is just wild. But um, yeah, my time there, like it exceeded expectations. Obviously winning the two national championships was amazing. And, you know, something that I fully went in there expecting to do, but at the same time, um, I think the journey and everything that led up to those championships and even in the seasons where we didn't win, um, I'm just, I would say off the field and just kind of the family feel that it has was so much more than I ever expected. And definitely when I look back at it now, like, yeah, the national championships are on my resume, but in terms of the impact that the coaches and the players and even professors and, and friends that I made off the team, um, such a larger impact in my overall life than just, you know, winning those championships. So you could definitely say that it ended up being the correct fit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, done. yeah. I mean, you never know. I'm sure, you know, all the schools I was looking at, and again, I don't think there was like a wrong choice. I just think there's some that again, like for what my goals were kind of my uber competitive nature and um, just like, you know, all the factors, it kind of, it just ticked all the boxes really. Um, and then, yeah, at the end of the day, looking back at it, like, so happy I went there, but I, I'm sure, honestly, I probably would have been happy at other schools too. So it's, it's interesting always to see, I guess, how people get to, you know, a certain university. Cause I remember I have a friend um, who his whole life, you know, the local school here is UW university of Washington, the whole life university of Washington, all this. Mm -hmm. And then he gets to, uh, you know, doing visits and stuff. And then for some reason, Colorado state took his heart. That was just how things went. And it's interesting to see how things can just, you know, certain decisions, you know, will impact that life that you have. Um, 
And so to speak on those championships, what made those teams so special, you know, to obviously be a championship caliber team? Um, what, what do you think really made those teams special? Uh, well, my freshman year, um, the senior class was unreal. It's like Tobin Heath, Casey Nagara, Nikki Washington, Jess McDonald, like Whitney Engen, Ashlyn Harris. Like it was just unreal. So going into it, it was just the standard was so high. And as a freshman, like it's already a huge transition. And I was just so wide eyed and like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, I'm a top recruit, but like, I might not see the field, you know, like it was, and it was never, I was never made to feel lesser or like, Hey, you're just a little freshman. Like you have to earn your time. Like I knew that, but so much of like me working hard and wanting to perform well was to send those seniors off with a championship. Cause they were just such great players and people. Um, and then I think uh, my senior year it was just bizarre like we didn't really have a great regular season I think we were like 10 5 and 2 or something going to the tournament we still had a team because our RPI was high but we had just really struggled and we had you know Crystal Dunn was playing like six different positions for us at different points and just really hadn't clicked and then we kind of just for the tournament where you're like you know what screw this like no one expects anything of us because we haven't had a great season um let's just prove them all wrong and that was kind of our motto and it just you know clicked for those six seven games and that's what you know the NCAA tournament what makes it so great and so crazy is it's you don't have to have a great season you just have to get in and then those six or seven games it's you just got to be the best in those games so we just clicked at the right time and I think we had you know again um kind of that feeling of, and it's still true, like we have, um, you know, everyone writes FTS on their armband at UNC and it's, you know, for the seniors and there's nothing better than like walking off the field, you won your last collegiate game ever and only the national champions can say that. So I think got that mindset of when you're an underclassman, like, hey, you're working so hard for these seniors, also for yourself and your own individual goals, but you, there's nothing better than I think as a freshman seeing those seniors like celebrate the, their final victory and then going on to have the careers they had and then as a senior selfishly of course like wanting that same experience for myself and was very fortunate to have it. It's always I'm always curious to sort of see how you know a championship team gets there because it's not always there's no like direct path you know there's always mm-hmm. yeah. different ways to get there and obviously you know there are some times where it's like, hey, whatever just happened, the regular season doesn't matter. You know, we've got a new season here. That it, The postseason is always a new season. So yeah, it's exactly. kind of cool to hear how that falls into place. Um, yeah. How did you become a Nike athlete? How did that, how did that all come together? Uh, so like senior, you know, fall semester, there hadn't even been, I think until the week I graduated in December, it was there was no mention of there being a women's professional league in the U.S. Right, the WPS had folded, and um, so in my mindset was, hey, like I think I'm going to go to Europe. And I'd actually um, been talking with Ali Krieger a lot. She was playing in Germany for um, FC Frankfurt. So in my mind, I there um, there were a couple Americans that had recently gone over. So I was like, that seems like a good place to be, like start my career. So. Um, even when the NWSL was announced, I kind of already had one foot in the door and Germany was already in contract negotiations with Bayern. So um, I was like, you know what, I, I want to do this. I had my mindset on doing this. There's so many unknowns with NWSL and like what it was going to look like, the college draft, like just, there was too much instability for me, I think, to, to change my mind about going to Germany and playing for a huge club like Bayern. So mm-hmm. um, I knew I was going to Germany and then, um, you know, the women's lacrosse coach at UNC, Jen Levy, is married to Dan Levy, who's one of the head guys at Wasserman Agency. And um, obviously UNC is a huge Nike school. And so um, I knew Jen a little bit, had obviously known Dan. And then, um, you know, Anton was kind of just like, hey, Dan, like, would you mind hooking up Amber with just like a shoe deal? You know, he represents all the, you know, big fish on the U.S. Mm -hmm. women's national team. So he's got his foot in with Nike. And it was just like, hey, like, it's kind of cool. Like I'm going to this huge Adidas club. And, and you know, be wearing Nikes, um, you know, pretty good marketing for them. Um, even though you know, I rushed out of college and then you know, more or less a nobody. But um, yeah, so that was kind of just uh, Dan helped me get that contract with Nike, and then I've just been able to kind of maintain that relationship with the reps there, and you know, very grateful that I'm you know still a Nike athlete after all these years. You've mentioned them a little bit, but how was your time, you know, overall with Bayern Munich, and you know, how did what do you remember from your time with them? 
That was great. Um, I think looking back at it now, I would say like, as a women's professional soccer player, you don't always have total control in your career and the teams that you play for and um, something we're, you know, working on changing here in the NWSL. But um, I think if I had to do it all over again, I probably would have stayed another six months or a year, honestly, before coming back to the NWSL when I did. Um, just because I was, I thought, developing really well, um, pl- had a re- really important, you know, role on the team considering, you know, I had more or less just joined. I was like scoring tons of goals, even from the defensive midfielder role. And um, it was just a really good fit for me, I think, in the way that the league played. Um, I mean, it's physical, but it is very tactical and technical as well. So I think, um, you know, it suited my strengths, but it also was kind of forcing me to work on the weaker sides of my game. So, um, and just the, you know, European soccer is just so different. It's like you sign a, a two, three year contract and that means something. It's two or three years. There's no trades, there's no cuts. Um, and it just, so it's a different feel, you know, you can, you can get comfortable, you can set roots and, you know, you can feel like, Hey, like, they're going to invest in me for these two, three years. Like it's not, you know, you don't have to always kind of be on edge about things, which is how a lot of players have to feel in the NWSL with the way things are. So um, no, I really enjoyed it. I like the coach at the time. He's no longer the coach. There were, you know, four or five Americans. There was always a few coming over on loan. And um, yeah, I just, it was great to experience European soccer. And I think as growing up, like, you know, it was so hard to find soccer on TV, especially women's soccer and just, being a part of the Bayern family, going to the men's games, you know, the Champions League, they won it that year. So I was there to see them play like Arsenal and Barcelona along the way. Um, and Pep Guardiola was the coach. So I would go eat lunch at the cafeteria and watch him run training sessions from, you know, while meeting my lunch. And it was really a great experience. And I think um, at the time, I just kind of looked at it as like a placeholder. And once I knew, oh, okay, the other cell is pretty legit. Like Portland's had one in 2013. I knew they held my rights. I was like, this looks like a pretty good spot to come. And, um, but looking back at it now, and you know, again, hindsight, it's great, right? But I think it would have served me better to stay another six months or a year um, before returning. Um, Cause it is harder, I think, to, to go to Europe later in your career. Like you get older and, you know, you kind of start your own family in one way or another and you know you don't want to you want to play in front of your family and friends and um I really do like any player that I talk to that's like kind of on the fence about NWSL in Europe I'm like if you really have that feeling to go to Europe like I think you should do it now I think you're better off doing it when you're younger maybe fresh out of college um because you know the NWSL hopefully it's at the point where it's going to be here for a while and once you're in it's a lot harder to leave I think the NWSL than it is to get in initially so um yeah definitely nothing but a positive experience at Bayern for sure now I I know that you might not 100% be sure about the situation just because it's probably her more uh decision than anything else but as far as I know right now the reigns holds the rights in NWSL for Rose Lavelle do you think that she'll spend any time in Seattle at some point like you said you know just she's kind of you know probably working with Europe and spending time with I think she's with Man City right now um yep. and it's just or is that just sort of you don't really know that kind of thing it's up to the player and it's so uncertain yeah I mean I don't know I think um I mean obviously it's her own personal decision but with her being you know a, a member of the national team I'm sure you know that's a conversation she's having with Blacko and you know her family and her agent and um, you know, I think whatever she thinks suits her best for her own development and, um, you know, her ambitions going forward. Um, it's not something that's really talked about around the team yet. Um, obviously, I think we'd all welcome a player of her caliber. Um, so I think, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's her decision and, and, you know, wish her best of luck again. I, I don't think you can really go wrong either Man City or Lorraine. So, um yeah but no it's it's not something that I am you know privy to that knowledge it's just always it's interesting to you know hear that you know your side of it with you know players going to Europe and really because I'm and when it comes to some of these sports I'm gotta admit I'm not 100% knowledgeable about soccer and it's interesting to see that you know technically they got the rights to her Mm -hmm. in the NWSL but just sort of interesting to see you know with that perspective of Europe and when you'd prefer to be there, you know, just really interesting to see how that all shakes out. 
how was your draft experience for the NWSL? And what was your first thought when you were drafted by Portland? What goes through your, your head, you know, when you're like, oh, you know, Ed, this is, you know, I've got to go to Portland now. Uh, so I had entered my name in the draft um, just because, <clears throat> well, Cindy Cohn, Parlo Cohn was the, she had more or less known she was going to get the Portland coaching job. But um, at the time, you know, I'd signed at Bayern, but she was like, hey, like, even if you want to return to the NWSL in like June, when the window transfer windows open, say like you hate your experience, you want to get out of there. Like you have to have entered your name in the draft NWSL at all that year. So I was like, all right, cool. Like I'll enter it in and um, didn't really think much of it. I had gotten some emails from some of the teams being like, Hey, like we know you're at Bayern. Like, do you know how long for, like, do you see yourself coming back in a few months? Or is this, I think I signed a year and a half deal initially. Like, are you going to be there? And I was like, I don't know. I just got here like two weeks ago. Like, you know, I haven't made that decision. I'm keeping an open mind. And um, so I was actually like on the bus to an indoor tournament, like my first competition with the team when like Twitter blows up and it's like, Oh, like in the third round, whatever the Portland Thornton select, you know, I, I don't even know what it said Amber Brooks or writes to Amber Brooks. And I remember being like, I'm confused and my team is like Amber I don't get it like you've signed with us like how can someone else draft you and I was just like yeah it's like American professional sports like it's a little weird like and I remember my coach being like wait like you're with us still like and I, yeah like I was like I'm pretty sure it just means like if I because I had an option at the end of the first six months like you know if I end up wanting to go back like you know they would have first claim at signing me to a contract it's like oh, okay so with Cindy you know around May and again I was like doing so well like I was scoring goals I'd been invited into the national team for a training camp and you know we both agreed like the season was also ending like I think end of July August so I would have come back for like two months and you know missed out on another like eight months of the German season so it just didn't really make sense to come back and it was more like hey stay and then maybe come back in the January window the following year so um yeah I mean I was happy that you know, I watched Portland's games. I obviously saw from afar, like what the crowds were like. And I knew Cindy from her being an assistant at UNC. So, um, you know, when I decided to come back, I can't even, I don't even think, I think it was known that Cindy wasn't returning. I don't know if Paul Riley had been hired yet. Um, but again, it was just like, for me, I was like, Hey, I'm cool playing with Portland. Like they're the reigning champs. It's a great setup. I hadn't spent much time in the Pacific Northwest at that point, but, um, and I was just, you know, I was, my mind was set on playing in the NWSL because I wanted to, you know, show Tom Sermani was the national team coach at the time, like, hey, like I can compete with these players that I'm competing against week in and week out. So that was my main motivation for returning at the time. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I honestly was fine returning to, to Portland, was happy about it, um, but I, I can definitely see how the whole discovery rights and drafting players rights when they might not even play in this league ever is just a very strange concept, especially if you are European. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. That, huh. That's always, I'm sure that's gotta be confusing when you're, you know, in some other place, not even aware of it. And then all of a sudden you're getting, you know, mentioned and people are blowing your phone up. You're like, what do you mean? I got drafted to some team, you know, I, that, that'd be an, that'd be an interesting surprise. Um, Huh. Interesting how that shakes out. What would you say caused the change, uh, the change from midfield to defense? I apologize if I screwed that up. Um, what really sort of uh, spurred that? Because from, you know, in my research, I was always reading good, good uh, reviews about you being a defender, but there was sort of, uh, from what I read earlier, at least, you know, midfield and now obviously defense, what sort of uh, inspired that? Yeah, I mean, I'd more or less been a defensive midfielder my entire career, um, you know, played forward in high school, but, you know, does that really even count? Um, I'd played in the back line, you know, with UNC a little bit sometimes, um, but really it just came down to, uh, w you know, with the dash my second season, 2017, we were just struggling. I think we had lost like six or seven games. Um, our coach had just been fired. Our assistant was promoted to the interim and we had played Orlando like the week before and got, you know, lost like three, zero or something. And then we were playing um, the next week in Orlando. And so 
um the interim was just like you know what like we need a shake up like amber i'm thinking of moving you back to center back see if we can like you know hold them a little bit and just let's just see how it goes and i was like sure i mean at this point like we just need to try something so um i went back there and we ended up winning 2-0 um and their front line was alex and sid and um Marta so I was like wow like this is cool it's easy center back you know um and then from there on it was just like all right that worked for game one let's try game two and I think we went on a little bit of a winning streak and um it just got to the point where I was like I, I like it back here like maybe I should have switched a long time ago it kind of suits you know again my strengths I think it hides my weaknesses a little bit better than defensive mid and it just got to the point I think defensive midfielders or a majority of them in the modern game are very much like box to box They're in I am just I am a true defensive midfielder it was in the sense that like I like to sit there shield the back line break up play and then pass it to someone further ahead of me for them to kind of work their magic and I just yeah it wasn't in my mental capacity or physical capacity to be running box to box all game long so I think playing the you know center back where the the whole in front of me and I can ping diagonal balls and still have the same defensive effort um that I was so good at defensive mid um so yeah that's kind of how it worked and I've really just stayed um ever since and yeah I mean looking back at it I'm like damn maybe I should have been this for longer in my career and I wonder where I'd be you know at now but um no it's, it's been great I really like it um obviously there's some days where I'm like, dang, it, it stinks. Cause you make one mistake and it's a goal against you. And maybe you've been great for 89 minutes and it's just one. Mm. So that's definitely something different from defensive midfielder. You know, you can pick and choose your moments. If you make a mistake, it's okay. You've got defenders behind you. And it's like, eh, I mean, you can hope your goalkeeper makes a great save, but um, you know, you get punished a lot more at center back. And I think that's been more of a, a mental adjustment for me is kind of that mental discipline and Hey, you got to be tuned in for, 90 95 minutes um so it's definitely i think more physically exhausting than or mentally than physically um but no i, I really enjoy it and i feel like i'm really being coached not only by our coaches here but by you know like lou and and steph and those veteran defenders that have been around like um and that was a lot really a lot of my interest in joining this team was hey like you know i want to be the best i can be at the center back position whatever that might be and um i just felt like i hadn't really been coached before it was just hey throwing you back there like try not to mess up um go with your instincts and i mean that gets you to a certain point but uh, uh, then it gets to the point where you know you have to learn the ins and outs of it and um yeah i'm really happy that you know here at the rain um i have coaches and, and teammates that are willing to help me it really sounds like it, it it clicked in the moment and then you just kind of rode with it you know um and it, it's interesting to hear that because that's that's kind of yeah. yeah. what I did when I played <laughs> obviously I'm not at that caliber you know but that's kind of was like okay I'm here to protect the goal that's about it I'm, I can't really go you know box to box I'll kind of get it up to you guys and you guys can you know do all the goal scoring I'll just stay back here and try to form some sort of wall <laughs> that's it's cool to hear how that kind of yeah. became reality <laughs> um if, if you could point out to anything or maybe a couple of things, what would you attribute your career longevity to? Because in any sport, really, some people obviously last longer than others. What what for you would you say is, you know, help you continue to, you know, go out there and, you know, wake up and say, you know, I'm ready for today and go out there and continue to continue to play? Um, I mean, I think, you know, my ability to stay healthy you know, injury free, you know, the reality of professional sports is you're only as good as you are available. So if you're constantly yep. injured or not, you know, making rosters, then at a certain point, you're going to be very disposable. So, um, you know, I think when I have played, you know, demonstrating, you know, consistency and that, you know, again, I might not be this magician that's, you know, making these unbelievable individual efforts and scoring these wonder goals. But I think, there's something to be said that, you know, I can be a player that's relied on to, you know, be very solid every game and, and bring a consistency that, you know, I think a lot of teams need. And um, yeah, I think just, I still love the game. You know, there's of course days where I love it more than others, but um, yeah, I just think I, I'm just still have a ton of competitiveness left in me and 
um, you know, I want want to win at everything, and you know, trainings to me like you you train how you or you play games how you train. So for me, um, you know, I'm that player that likes to go hard in every training and and really kind of set the tone, um, you know, for myself and hopefully lead by example for my teammates. So um, I think it's just a combination of you know learning from my body, right? Like taking those first few years of my career and kind of listening to my body, figuring out what type of diet and recovery methods and sleep habits and other things uh, work best for me. And then once figuring those out, putting it all together and, and just being really consistent with it. And, you know, just being a good pro, I think like, you know, if you had to ask a teammate or something like, oh, like they would probably say like, I'm just really good pro. Like I do the little things right and over and over again. And, you know, I'm not super flashy, but I get the job done and usually at a pretty high level. So um, I think, yeah consistency and that ability to perform day in and day out in training and in games that's that's really valuable at, at the professional level now I want to kind of start to transition into speaking about Seattle what do you remember most from that first stint with well then Seattle obviously now it's not called mm -hmm. Seattle you know but what do you remember most from that first time because in doing research so that trade was that trade a surprise then mm -hmm. Yeah. So, How did that so, go down? Um, so as I played for Portland in 2014 and then I was back at Germany playing on loan and I was surprised to be traded to Western New York. Uh, I think it was like November or something of 2014. And again, like my Bayern teammates were like, I don't get it. Like, <laughs> how are you just traded without knowing or wanting to? And I was like, yeah, that would bend up is all for you. So, um, you know, I was one of, I think, a few players at Western New York that weren't upset to be there because my entire extended family is from the Rochester area. So it's like, all right, like, is this, you know, my first choice? Like, of course, I preferred to be in Portland. Like, you know, I was told that I was going to be a franchise player and someone to build around and, you know, whatever. But again, it's pro sports. So it happens. And, um, you know, so I was in Western New York all of preseason and then, um, we had had a few days off and I was, you know, coach sends me a text like, Hey, Amber, do you mind showing up early for training today? And, and in my head, I'm like, Oh, we're just going over video. Cause we had had a scrimmage against the college team. And I'm like, Oh, we're just, and then the GM, I walk in and the GM's in the room and I'm like, hmm, don't think he'd be in here if it was just <laughs> video analysis. Like, and you know, that's when I'm like, Oh, we've been traded and blah, blah, blah. And he went on this big spiel and I was just like, so like, where was I traded to? Like, you haven't told me he goes, Oh, like Seattle. And I was like, Ah, oh, okay. And, and I think, um, I think the national team was in camp at the time, uh, because, um, at, at the time I was training a lot with Carly Lloyd's, um, trainer James, and he was texting me because Carly had also been traded from the flash and, you know, wasn't overly happy about not being aware of it. And he was like, Hey, like, I'm pretty sure like you're involved in a trade with the rights to Abby and Sid LaRue's coming the other way. And I was just like, okay. And I actually remember it was, it was almost, six years ago tomorrow because it's my niece's birthday and it was the day she was born um and I was set to go home and I'm on the phone with Laura and, and Bill and um obviously Seattle Seattle had made the, the championship the year before and you know they're this great team and you know being a midfielder at the time still I was like I think I was literally like well, but Laura like why why did you trade for me like you don't need me your midfield stacked you know and on Western New York, like we were a younger team, like that's when Sam Mewis and Abby Dahlkemper and them were just rookies. They had just been drafted, but I was like, I was set to play an important role. I was like co-captain. Yeah. So I was like, this is just weird. Like, I don't really get why I've been bunched in this trade. Like it doesn't really seem to benefit me or even Seattle in any way. Like I'm, you know, Kim and Jess and Keelan, like there's no way I'm going to start over those players. Um, and, and so, yeah, I was totally shocked. And um, yeah, obviously had it, having already been traded, like five months before I was just like what in the heck did I just sign up for like you know I was over at Bayern and everything was good and then now I've been on three teams in a year and um yeah so you know I wasn't aware of it and um you know looking back at it now uh you know obviously can laugh about it but yeah at the time it seemed like my world was ending and I was just like you know I don't stand a chance of playing for Seattle and at the time you know I I hadn't been invited into national team camp since Jill took over, but I was still like, Hey, like there's still like that chance. But I was like, 
not if I'm not even starting for my club team, there's no way. So that dream kind of seemed, you know, to, to disappear. And, um, but yeah, like now looking back at it, like I learned so much from, you know, Kim and Jess and Keelan and just being a part, I think having, that was the first time I was like on a team, but didn't really contribute in terms of being on the field. Like obviously at UNC, I played a ton at Bayern at Portland. And so it was kind of a reality check for the first time. And then it was, um, I will say like, even though I didn't play a lot, um, I think Laura, you know, Harvey was the coach and, and the entire team like still made me feel important. And I was a hundred percent bought into the team and the success that we were having. Like I celebrated every goal, like I scored it. And it just, you know, of course there were times where I thought, you know, maybe I deserve more of an opportunity to start and didn't, it, but I was still a hundred percent like, behind the team and you know I was gutted when we lost in the championship and um yeah I think like I learned how to be a good teammate like when you're not playing and and to just learn as much as I could from I mean I was training and having to mark him little like every day so I definitely got better um but yeah it was definitely having been a surprise and then obviously traded to a situation where you know starting time was just not realistic um at the time it it was like definitely really tough on me what um what were your first impressions obviously I'm sure you can take time from then and from now uh of Megan Rapino when you first you know what was your first sort of thoughts no she was great I always say like again like you know there's so many talented players on the team that year and I mean there still are but I will say like, and having, it was a world cup year, you know, it's 2015 and she was obviously preparing to play a huge role for the U S but, you know, she showed up every day and she treated me just like I was, you know, a national team teammate or, you know, a Kim or a Jess or someone who, you know, was a a veteran key player for the team. And, you know, um, she was always complimenting me when I did something well. And I think our lockers were like, not next to each other, but in the same area, like, like always saying hello and just really never made me feel smaller than I was. And so I always, you know, appreciated that about her because I've, I've been on teams with other national team players and, and it's not that way. Um, they make you feel inferior and like, you're not, you know, worthy of being on the same team as them. And so I think I really respect her for that. And, you know, it's been the same, you know, this year since she's been around the last few weeks and, you know, she's, very quick in practice like if you play a good pass or make a good tackle she's there to compliment you um and it's yeah it's been really good having her you know around the locker room and and at training for sure do you have any sort of preference between because in that first time if i'm uh, i'm not losing my uh, memory here the first time was in memorial stadium and now now it's mm-hmm. shaney stadium do you have any preference between the two or uh i mean Memorial was just like a fortress. Like it was obviously you can't beat the location. I mean, um, the playing surface, I'm always like looking back at it cause we trained there too. And I'm like, maybe it's cause I was 24, but I was like, how the heck did I train here every day, play all these games on this. And I was like, and my like body just cause then the years after when I would come visit with Houston, I'd play one 90 minute game and I like couldn't walk for two days. And I was just like, I don't get it. So like, yeah, in terms of like, I think you would say it was just, I mean, I think the rain were like undefeated for like 30 games or something like that at Memorial over the course of a couple of seasons. And yeah, it was just, it's a really hard venue to play at as an away team. I can assure you that. Um, But Cheney still has some of those same qualities. Like it's a bit smaller of a field. So we honestly play a different style at Cheney than we do at home or like we're, we're going to, like, that's kind of our emphasis. I think you could see it a little bit in the fall series. Even you can just defensively press like way more than you can on a larger pitch. So um, no, I mean, I think we all prefer natural grass. Um, I think in terms of like location, like down Seattle, like accessibility for fans and everything, probably a bit easier um but no I think part of the mentality that we've had in yeah last year was just difficult right we had two home games so but I think ongoing going into this season is like hey we need to make Cheney just as much as of a fortress as Memorial was like this place where teams come in and they know they're in for a tough game and we just kind of suffocate them and you know let's try and you know let's not lose a game at home is kind of our mentality 
it's 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 always interesting to sort of hear about you know the away perspective of it because at least with memorial my my high school doesn't have like a home stadium right technically because it's in the middle of downtown kind of weird mm -hmm. but so that's memorial i have a lot of memories from memorial even going to the rain games back then and it's certainly an interesting venue obviously if you look a certain way the space needles like right behind you you know but uh interest interesting to hear how that you know how it feels to actually you know play on that surface um as well as uh as i i did read up a little bit on the website that the, there's an effort to make more of a you know actual stadium or in facility for the rain so that's something I'm looking forward to see because I know right now Shaney Stadium is rain and I don't know when the rainier season starts but definitely yeah, you know it's like pretty yeah so it's like hey you know it'd be pretty cool if they actually had their own thing but I'm, as far as I understand that's in the works um, just hope that's obviously sooner rather than later uh, yeah. and you touched on it on a little bit uh, for your time with Portland but you know coming over here to the Pacific Northwest how has that been and what do you think overall as a whole about the Pacific Northwest? Oh, I like it a lot. Uh, really, I'd only, you know, as a child and teenager been to Portland for Nike had like a Nike 50 camp. They brought like the 50 top recruits in my class out for like four days of training. Um, so really, other than that, like, you know, my club team didn't play any tournaments up here. Um, so I really didn't have any knowledge or experience. And I remember even saying, like, I looked at California schools, but I was like, had I known, like, how the Pacific Northwest was, like, I probably would have looked at, like, an Oregon, a UW, like, because it's, it's really nice, like, especially... I mean, okay, the weather is the weather, but like at least from May to August, like, you know, it's going to be more or less beautiful. And I enjoy, you know, all the water. I think like there's literally like scientific studies that say like being around just less stressed. And um, I, you know, I agree with that. Like we, you know, live in really nice apartments down at Point Ruston and, you know, the water's not out my, you know, front or back, but you know, the water walks right there. And so being able to take, you know, our dog for walks every day, like it just, I think water just naturally kind of brings peace and tranquility to people and makes you happy. And that's certainly an effect that it's had on me. And um, I'm not the biggest like hiker, but, you know, I've done kind of classic rattlesnake um, ledge and, you know, that lake even. Um, and then, yeah, I've been, you know, Owen Beach around here. And so I think just being, you know, it's got the nature for you but it's also got you know the metropolitan Seattle if you, if you want to go up there and um yeah no I I really enjoy it for considering um you know I hadn't really spent much time and, uh you know it's honestly like okay this was the first time I really spent the whole year I was here I was here in the off season and I was kind of here it gets you know seasonal depression and just it's gloomy but it wasn't as bad as I thought. And it was nice to get that one snow in February. Like I met, you know, I saw a decent amount of snow growing up in Pennsylvania. And um, yeah, I think for me, I'm used to the wind, the rain or the rain, the wind is one thing that I don't enjoy. I feel like that just makes things that much worse. But um, no, I, w I was pleasantly surprised by how much I was like, wow, the Pacific Northwest, like is pretty great, you know, like, and I can see why so many, you know, whether they're from California or just transplants from other places are like, like it here and, and stay here and make it home because it, it does have, you know, I think a lot of quality. It's, it's, uh, I think you really nailed it when you said that period from May to August. Cause when I think about it, that's kind of the, that's pretty accurate. I'd say like, oh, that's right. We're still in March. I'd say April still kind of iffy, but then I think May is definite. Yeah. So I think that was pretty spot on. And even with, uh, it's cool to hear, obviously, whenever, you know, someone, an athlete, spend you know continues to spend their time here um i don't know i just i guess it's the city pride thing a local pride thing just to have people enjoy it here mm -hmm. so it's always really good to hear good things about it um what differences have you seen organization or hey, organization wise between you know seattle houston and portland what are some things that you could say have been different between those three clubs um i mean i think here at the rain, um, obviously, you know, Leon has bought into a large portion of the ownership, but I think even from, you know, my first go around with the club, Bill and Teresa are very involved. And I think in a positive way, 
um, you know, whether it's them just showing up to training or gain, like just kind of, um, you know, they're approachable owners, they're, you know, they're caring. Um, you, I think just seeing their face, like I, I think in Portland and Houston, I saw the owners like, I don't know, a handful of times over the five years I was there on those teams. And um, so I, I like the fact that, you know, okay, like they're owners, it's a business, like sometimes there's tough conversations, but um, they really make you feel like a part of the family and like, you know, you're an important part of the club when you're on the team. Um, and then, yeah, I think it's different. Obviously we're not, you know, affiliated with a men's team, like both Portland and Houston are. Um, but again, I think just having, you know, Leon come in and, and again, like you said, whether it's, you know, a specific training facility for us or, or a game field, um, you know, there are a lot of um, future investments that they've committed to the club that, you know, like you said, hopefully happen sooner than later. Um, but I just think it's, you know, just brought another level of, you know, in general, like feeling like our club's invested in and just little things are, are taken care of, um, like so that we as professionals can just worry about showing up to training and performing on the field. And, you know, um, like you said, it's, you know, there's more of us staying year round, you know, and making this kind of our home base while we're on the team and, and feeling a little bit more sense of, I guess, security, you could say. And again, like things happen, trades, cuts, like, you know, that's part of sports, but I think um, really feeling cared for both, you know, not just as a player, but as a person and, you know, pretty much if we go to them with, you know, any ask, as long as it's not totally ridiculous, like they're willing to accommodate and, you know, just kind of make it feel like home so that all we have to focus on is what's going on in the field. So I really appreciate that like approach from Bill and Teresa and, you know, the investment and kind of the vision that, you know, they both have and like Leon have for us you know, getting to a point where we're the best, you know, team on and off the field. How would you say then your set, uh, you know, obviously your second time here, how would you say it's been so far to this point? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it's been very different, obviously, like coaching staff besides Sam is all different. You know, the Predmores are still involved, obviously. Um, I think there's only like four or five players that were on the team in 2015 that are still here. We, you know, we're in a different city, different. So, you know, I was with the host family back then, um, you know, just a young player and, you know, I've had a bit more of a role here. And um, I mean, I think part of my desire to play for the rain was just, I wanted to be challenged, um, you know, in training, I wanted to be challenged. Like I had to perform to, you know, make the starting lineup. And, um, you know, I think we have such quality players that it is a battle in training and it's a battle to, you know, make even the game day roster. Um, and, you know, a coaching staff, um, you know, Freed, I, I really enjoy, um, Sam, obviously we go way back and I just think it's a good mix of personalities and, you know, we have quite a few veterans and obviously, you know, I'm one of them experience wise, but I still, you know, I'm fully aware that, you know, this is only my sec, whatever, if you want to call it third year with the team. So I think, um, you know, wanting the best uh, for the team and having those ambitions to win a championship, I just thought this was the best team to be at, but also to be challenged individually. So I can hopefully, you know, reach my potential and, um, you know, just be the best player that I can be. I thought that surrounding myself with this coaching staff and these owners and, and these teammates that I have was going to give me the best chance of doing that. If I had to put you on the spot, could you pick a funniest current teammate that you have? Funniest current? Um, I mean, I will say Allie Watt laughs a lot and she has a very distinct laugh. So maybe it's just, I hear it. We all hear it more than anyone else's laugh. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't say that there's someone that's like always like joking. Like I feel like there's a few that are, yeah, but like you always hear her laughing, whether she's the one making the joke or, or laughing at the joke or just comment or anything. I would say it's Allie has like, you can hear her like from anywhere on the field. 
How was the fall series for you? Because I know you mentioned a little bit, you know, only having the two home games, but what was that entire experience like? Because I know in any league, you know, in the past year, things were entirely different. Mm-hmm. So how, how did that whole, uh, ex- how was that whole experience for you? Uh, well, I mean, I was happy, you know, we had the fall series. It was better than, you know, having no competitive games at all. Um, you know, like you saw, like a, quite a few of my teammates went abroad and that was definitely a, a thought that I had, you know, would it be better? But for me, you know, being new to the club or new again, and then being, you know, free being new, I was like, you know, I think this is a important time for me to get to know him and him to get to know me better. And, um, you know, again, like when a lot of, the, it was more the veteran players, I would say that left, like I was one of the few left, um, you know, in the area. So I was like, yeah, I can kind of step up and take more of a leadership role and, and kind of figure out what Fareed wants from me and from the team. And, um, you know, it was, again, a lot of really good training. You know, we had a long, like our third preseason basically leading up to it. And then um, I think you saw it. It, it was tough. Um, the games, you know, obviously, you know, Utah is a tough place to play in. I think our last game against them at home kind of showed that mentality that I was mentioning, like, hey, this is our home field, like, we're gonna come after you on it, and we're gonna make it hard for you to, you know, play the way you want to play. Yeah, and then, you know, playing in Portland, whether there's fans or not, it's still quite the venue, and um, yeah, you know, it was a good test for, um, you know, our team without, you know, quite a few of its, you know, international and, and, you know, starting players, and a good opportunity for younger players. Um, And those that, you know, hadn't gotten many minutes, say in the Challenge Cup or were new to the club um, to kind of to get those minutes and really kind of, I think, set the tone and and kind of the foundation for, okay, we're heading into an offseason like this is what Freed knows we can do what he wants us to do and and let's come in, you know, even with a longer preseason, I think it kind of helped, you know, the group of us that were around to have that foundation. starting with preseason and you know it's just nice to it was nice to show up to preseason and you know of course there were some new faces but uh you know I think this was the first well in Houston that the coach got fired halfway through but like this was the first time really going into the second season like in a row with the same coach that I've ever had more or less had a new coach every year of my career so I think that was something that I was just like, Oh, like, this is nice. Like he knows me. I know him. Like I don't have to, of course, like I need to show well in training. So, you know, I can, you know, make the roster and the lineup, but like, you know, I don't have to feel like I need to impress him or show him what my game is. Like he, he knows me and he knows my quality. So that was a breath of fresh air and really nice considering last year was just like crazy. I'm sure having some consistently consistency is always pretty good with a head coach, you know, yeah. not necessarily a re- revolving door there. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on the organization uh, partnering with the black future co-op and what does that sort of say to you about the organization itself and what they, you know, do off the field? Yeah. I mean, this club is like very involved with the community and obviously I think um, it was a tough transition, not just for like the club, but I think obviously from the fan perspective, when the team moved right from Seattle to Tacoma, and I know that was, and then even when, you know, we be dropped rain and became, oh, all rain, right? Like I know, you know, you can, it's very obvious on Twitter and just, there was a lot of, you know, kind of, fans and other people like upset with you know how much change had happened considering like again memorial was such a fortress and the team had experienced so much success up there that it was just like ah like a lot you know change is 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 hard and, and painful a lot of times and um so i think the club really set out to you know exemplify like hey like you know we may have moved 45 minutes south but we're still you know serving the Puget Sound and you know we need to set up roots here in Tacoma because there's you know I think every major city has a lot of work to be done but um and you know there's a great you know Lou Barnes and and Danny are really kind of leading and and Jazz Spencer are are really leading um you know the cause with making sure that you know because Bill's a very hands-on owner like I said and he wants us to um, you know, great members of the community, um, and to have the club contribute and obviously having, 
you know, a club like Lyon backing us, I think just gives us more opportunity and leeway to, to do so. So, um, but it's really important that we, you know, partner with, you know, causes and funds and organizations that we truly believe in. And so that it's not like, you know, not a punishment, but it's like, you know, eventually we'll get to the point where we can have uh, appearances and we can meet with fans and, and, um, you know, have more of a hands-on experience that players are wanting to do that, that it's not like, oh, it's just an obligation. Like we have to do this and that, like we wanted to make sure we were partnering with, um, yeah, partnerships that we really believed in and that we could make a long lasting change and not just for the optics of, oh, hey, like we're donating this much to them. Like, here's a check, do what you want with it. Like, we just want the article and then the recognition. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, like we want to be like really involved hands-on when we can be obviously, hopefully soon and, and make it a long lasting partnership. Cause you know, obviously again, with hopefully a new training facility, a, a new stadium, like these are like roots that we want to have in this area for, you know, however many years. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's great that um, again, like it's not, it's not just for optics. It's not just to, oh, we had to, you know, in this Paul series, pick a, pick a fund to play for. And, you know, you know, for that four games, like rally around the cause, like, no, like these are all genuine, like, you know, personal causes that we believe in and um, that we want to like spend our time and, and, the, and the club's money, right. Um, investing in. It's, it's always really cool to see whether it's a team or a, or the league, you know, sort of, be involved like that and or whether it's you know taking the first step like at least when I saw it when the uh when the end uh, WNBA uh started their season back up and just seeing what the storm have done and obviously you know uh I don't know it just seems like the the WNBA and the NWSL at least when I'm looking at it have kind of sometimes they take the step forward like first mm -hmm. and it's really mm -hmm. cool to see that you know just being front runners for that um, because I think that is important to make these steps. Obviously, you know, the product on the field is great, but, you know, to see that involvement in these real life issues is, is, is really cool. And especially when it's, uh, whether or not it's your home club or not, it's, it's really cool to see that. And I, uh, it's definitely something to appreciate. Um, is there any sort of current aspect of your game that you're working on right now in training, or are you just kind of working towards just being better player as a whole yeah I mean I think um just being better as a whole again I think I have to I'm kind of reminding some teammates and coaches sometimes that like hey I know I'm, I'm 30 and I've been around a while but like this is really only my third year as a center back and there is a learning curve and again like you know I think initially when I was thrown into center back it was just to fix fix a hole and it was just like hey like try not to you know make too many mistakes and just go with your instincts your instincts will you know will be fine and again like do a lot of the defensive midfielder instincts do translate well to center back but there are some that you know there's habits that I've had to break and habits that I've had to learn and um yeah I think you know for me like I've I'm probably you know, really well known for my ability to hit a, you know, diagonal ball on a dime. And, um, you know, I'm really good at heading and I'm pretty strong in the tackle, but um, say dribbling and taking space. Again, I think having been a defensive midfielder where you're usually crowded and there's not a ton of room around you, like getting that quick pass off is definitely more of what I was accustomed to uh, versus now as a defender, sometimes I'm having to dribble and take space and draw at an opponent before I dish it. Um, or even, you know, defensively, I think knowing, um, you know, when cause I, I do like to tackle. So I'm, I'm more inclined to step with a forward because I want to get in that tackle. But what happens if the ball's played over top instead, you know, like, so I think um, just kind of tailoring my instincts a bit and just kind of making, there's just so much gray area. I think in defending, there's no set like, Oh, if this happens to this, but it's like, there's so many different scenarios in a game that you can't train or learn that way. So I think just making as much black and white as possible so that in a game and then just repetition. Right. And again, that's probably the hardest part about COVID happening is like, even though I've played tons of games now as a center back between the dash and going to Adelaide in the off seasons, um, it is just so different, like with different players and a different coach, different goalkeepers. Right. So 
um, it was hard to kind of get that continuity. And then obviously the challenge cup, like, you know, the roster was rotating because there was four games in between just wasn't a realistic environment to like, Hey, like this is going to be the back line for the next, you know, seemingly if you know, everything goes well, like maybe for the next like 10 games, you know? And so I think as much as like, you know, whether it's Lou or I working together, like we've both been around the league a lot, like we were teammates before, but there's little nuances that like, we just need to keep learning from each other. And then, you know, having different goalkeepers behind us, different outside backs, there's just been a, there's just a ton of change and rotation and everything last year, some of it because of COVID and some of it because I think over half the team was new last year and Fareed was new. So um, I think just kind of gelling with, um, you know, whoever it might be that I'm playing with in the back and then just kind of, yeah, again, holistically working on being a better player, but I think targeting some of, oh, these, these tend to be more of the mistakes I'm making. Let's let's spend extra time addressing them, going over them on film. And, and then it hopefully, you know, in a game, you don't really hope that you have those situations to work on, right? Because you don't, you know, but um, if they do come up, like, <clears throat> am I fixing them in a game situation? But yeah, just very happy that, you know, I've got coaches and, and teammates that are definitely you know we work off one another and, and we're always you know I think defending it's it, as a lot of it is 1v1 when it comes down to it but um you know we're not on an island and then we're there to cover each other and, and work together and we make each other look better or look worse so I think um just kind of having that mentality of we're a team but obviously individually we need to take care of our own battles as well now, I want to ask you about this. I asked, uh, I spoke with Bethany Balser uh, a little bit ago about it. What do you, you know, if I had to put you in charge of this, right? If say in some scenario you were in charge of this, what do you think the media needs to do better about, you know, at least promoting women's sports? Because that was something that uh, obviously with, um, so much taking place even recently just with uh, the NCAA tournament and the women's team, the women's uh, tournament, not getting obviously any sort of fair cut with whether it was the, you know, the bags that they got, the swag bags, or obviously the locker room in that situation. Yeah. And even NWSL not really being on ESPN, like ever from what I understand, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then at least I did a, I have my weekly show that I do every Tuesday. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was uh, the 2020 interview, some news station around here did it, and they completely failed to mention the Storm who had won a title. I mean, winning a title, how do you, you know, yeah. what do you, at least, if, if I'm making sense, I don't know, I might be rambling. Um, what sort of changes do you think we need to see in media? Because I feel like a me the media does a, plays a huge part in obviously not promoting a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think, we have to first like acknowledge the American sports culture. Like it's not, especially soccer in and of itself, right? Like it's not America's game. Like it's, that's football, it's baseball, it's basketball. It's, and that's just, again, a huge difference from the European culture where like everyone, like if I was like, Oh, I play women's professional soccer, they'd be like, Oh, like for Bayern Munich, you know, like for here, I'm like, I say, and they're like, okay, like, they don't even know the name of the team, you know, or, like, it's, like, oh, NWSL, is that, like, uh, semi-pro, or, you know, so I think we need to, like, acknowledge, and that's fine, like, right, because the, as a country, like, we are great at a lot of sports, like, you know, Olympics come around, and we win all of these medals, and it's because, yeah, we've got so many children involved with so many different sports, and, like, I'm not saying that that it's a bad thing, it just, it is, right, like, European culture is so much more centered on soccer, so, mm -hmm. um, and then even, yeah, like, women's sports, I mean, it's hard, um, I mean, again, Europe, it's been a while since I've been over there and I'm not quite sure the media coverage of women's sports, but um, yeah, I think it's just, it's unfortunate that society has kind of deemed that women's sports aren't as entertaining as men's sports. And again, I'm not sure if that's, if you're looking at it, like we're just, women are just so much further behind, like, you know, whether it's like voting rights and, uh, you know, other things, like we've just had to wait so much longer for those rights and that ability. So um, it's always kind of been like a men come first. And then the mentality is like, oh, women should just be grateful that like, because the men make money that you guys can function or even have a league. And, and it's, 
yeah, that mentality, I think, is just ingrained so deeply, just like a lot of other issues with the U.S., right, and other mentalities that Americans have. Um, So I don't, like, I don't know, like, a quick fix other than, like, you know, something like what you're doing, right, like, interviewing me, and it's, like, we all have, like, such different and interesting like stories right like there's not one size fits all especially when it comes to women's sports because we haven't had the same access and not privilege but the same like you know ability to you know advance to the professional level as a lot of men's players have so um you know again it's like to me like of course watching like an EPL game like to me is way more interesting than MLS game. Right. But like NWSL is probably like, I mean, I still think the most like, you know, team for team, the most competitive and hardest league in in the, in the world. And I feel like, okay, I've only played in Germany and Australia and the U S but like, that's a pretty good, like consensus of, of what it, you know, I think Rachel Daly said it the other day on a podcast she was on like any given day and team that's in last place can beat the team in first place like it just that's how competitive and deep the rosters are and so um I just think to me like watching the women's world cup is just as exciting as the men and maybe it's kind of a female maybe I know some of those stories and I know hey, like, I know this player, like, I know something they went through when they were younger, or something they're going, like, I know part of their story, and again, maybe because I'm in the women's soccer world that I know that, but um, yeah, I just think, you know, getting around to doing more interviews like this, like, having more, you know, the ability to tell our stories, right, because, you know, it's great, like, you know, if, like, even for, like, Bethany Balser, right, like, you know, like she comes to my, oh, she's a forward, she scores goals, but there's like so much to her and so much more to her journey and what got her here and what she's experienced since being here that like, okay, like you might see her because she scored a goal, but like when you know all that, you become more invested and it's like, hey, like, no, this is really cool. Like it took, you know, her, like she was an NAIA player and she wasn't drafted and now she's going into youth or the women's senior national team camp. And so I think it's when you learn those like sometimes intimate details or, you know, those kind of the storylines behind these players. That's when you're like, Oh, like, let me, let me Google this player. Let me, but like you said, what 4% of ESPN and other major sports media is, is devoted to women. And again, I don't know if it's what the quick fix is other than literally like putting it on. Cause it is entertaining, you know, like to me, like I rather watch, one of our games than watch, you know, Neymar, Ronaldo, like flop on the ground and wail and, you know, think they broke their leg every time they get tackled. So, um, but yeah, I just think part of it, like we have to understand that it's just so like deeply rooted in American society and what they've said is entertainment, you know, or like even it wasn't that long ago that like, I remember some people were like joking, like, oh, we'd probably like have be on ESPN if we wore like short shorts and tank tops or sports bras to play, you know, because it's like sex sells for females, you know, and it's like, instead of, Hey, we are quality players at the playing in toughest league in the world. And we're the best 200 players um, in this league. And so, um, yeah, again, I, you know, I'm just kind of rambling too, but. Uh, oh, Hey, no, yeah, you I think get a lot of points. Telling more stories, agree. more of our stories and yeah, just like, you know, putting it out there. And again, it's like, I think treating us not as a charity and like, yes, we are an investment a hundred percent. Like you have to, I liked um, Mitch Purse's like, you know, like statement at the white house the other day, like you have to water the flowers to expect them to grow or expect any return. Right. So it's like, we've had how much fewer like investment in us, whether it's financially or just resources or education or anything. And we've, done pretty well like women as a whole certainly the U.S. women's soccer players and the national team um, imagine if you invested just you know a tenth of what you did or of what you know society and companies do in men's sports and women's sports imagine you know it's but for now we're still playing catch-up or even still like trying to convince people that women should be playing sports and and that it is entertaining so it's definitely frustrating but 
hopefully in my in my lifetime it gets to a point where women are valued you know in the sports world just as much as men I, I don't think you were rambling at all I think at least when I spoke with Bethany that was it was the same thing it's like I don't think there is necessarily a thing that you can that's like a quick fix it's kind of something that you've got to work towards which obviously I don't think that it have you know it should have been something that needed to be worked for, toward in the first place it should have been you know fixed at the beginning but it's it's um you know to speak on Europe I remember when I spoke with Jewel Lloyd of the storm she said when you know when they go over when the WNBA players go over to Europe they're treated like you know like a professional basketball player they're just not like, oh you're a, a a girl that plays basketball no it's it's you know they're treated differently there um, and it, it, it is, you know, with that, I think you're exactly right speaking about how just American culture has treated, you know, these sports. I think that it hits it right on the head um, because it's, um, shoot, I'm trying to remember my memory is a little bit uh, poor, but sh that's what Bethany was mentioning is like, oh, you know, people are kind of accustomed to just seeing these men's sports. So when they watch a women's score, uh, what, you know, like a women's uh, NWSL game, they're expecting what they see from the men's teams. It's not how that works, you know? So yeah. I, I definitely think, you know, it is hard to sort of say, is there a quick fix? I don't know if you can fix it that easily. I think it is, like you said, it's kind of something that's rooted. Um, and even to speak on what you said, I'm, I'm just grateful to have, you know, have you on and Bethany on. And I'm uh, just, because I mean, obviously right now, technically not physically in Seattle, but I still count it. I, I could care less if it's not directly in Seattle. You know, you guys count to me because technically I cover Seattle teams, but Tacoma, yeah. I'm, I'm going to say the same thing. I don't care, you know, um, but, you know, that's yeah. what I'm trying to do. Like you said, with telling these stories, that's my point. You know, obviously, you know, looking at the numbers for these players is great, but at the end of the day, anybody could go and Google that. You know, I'm trying to tell that story and trying to, you know, who is Amber Brooks? What is her background? How did she start? You know, that's, that is the goal here, you know, and just continuing to work at it, really. That's all I, I guess yeah. I, I can do my part is continue to try and work at it and just, you know, keep moving forward and excited to get to some of these games here, actually. Um, just waiting to figure out when those tickets go on sale. Um, yeah. So, you know, but it's, I, I think you hit on some good points. I don't think that was rambling at all. I think you mentioned some good points there. So with that being said, what are you most excited for in 2021 and would it potentially being having those fans back in the stands? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, again, like even not really, I would say playing an important role on the team back in 2015, like I still, you know, the fans still knew my names and they were still wanting autographs and still, you know, made me feel like I was, you know, Megan Rapino, And so, um, you know, I think being back at Cheney and I remember just even the one game that we played, uh, when I was on the dash and came up and, you know, it was, I think it was like May or beginning of June, it was just a beautiful, like spring early summer day. And there were tons of fans and, um, just being like, Oh, like, okay, like this isn't Memorial, but it, it's still like a, it's still a great venue and a great atmosphere. And, um, yeah, I've definitely missed the fans in general. And, you know, I think, my mom's like at a ton of games and she always buys a season ticket, even though I'm like, mom, you can get free tickets through me. She's like, no, I want to support the league or, you know, the team, like whatever it is. And um, so I think it'll be really cool. Like she's booked her flight out. She's going to be here for our first challenge cup game. So I think even just having, you know, a familiar face in the stand and her, and that was definitely like, she was chomping on it. Like, I think she was going more insane than I was last year with not the ability to have fans. She's like, you sure I can't like come to the challenge cup and just watch from the fence. And I'm like, mom, are you crazy? Like, no, like it's a bubble. Like can't see anyone. And so I think, yeah, just, I think after you realize how important the fans are, whether, you know, certainly home game, um, but even just like away, like the general atmosphere, like it, it was harder to like mentally and physically get up for those games where like, there just weren't, fan, you know, it almost was just like, it. they always felt like scrimmages almost to a certain mm -hmm. point. Cause they're just, so I think it's one of those things like you don't fully appreciate it until you don't have it. And then you're like, Whoa, this is weird. Like this could, you know, feel like I'm in high school, but there's not even parents here even. So yeah, I definitely think getting fans back in the stands and, you know, really, I feel like I've 
not even played like a true game for the rain. I don't even know if they counted the challenge cup or the fall series stats like at all. So I'm like, I feel like I'm like a newbie again and I still need to play that first game, you know, official game for the rain. So there's definitely a lot of like excitement um, for all of us individually and collectively. Yeah, it's definitely uh, interesting waiting for that. And um, shoot, I'm just like, I keep looking on Ticketmaster. I'm like, all right, tickets, please. But, you know, yeah. just got to wait. And it's uh, even, even with supporting the team, obviously I have the flag now. But when I spoke with Bethany, um, I had to ask my mom. I was like, do we still have, because we have scarves from when it was Seattle and jerseys from when it was Seattle. So technically they were outdated. Mm -hmm. But I was like, ah, shoot, because at least with my recording situation, if this isn't here, it's all oh, it's put down. It's a yellow wall, so I'm not, you know. But I, I'm, I'm trying yeah. to figure out now whose jersey I'm gonna get. This is tough. It's gonna have to be one of you guys. I'm like, ah, oh, shoot. Yeah. I can't pick favorites. I might just have to get two. Um, yeah. So you know, um, now I've changed the name of it. It's my lightning round now. It used to be, you know, uh, fast favorites, but I've got a lightning round yeah. now. Um, what is a if you had to pick one and if there's one that you know you absolutely need what is one game day item that you cannot go without Ooh, i used to have a ton of superstitions and routine and it's had to adapt because things have gone crazy um honestly probably <laughs> it's not like an item but my pregame it's it's not even really a like it's not like a prayer it's kind of just like a motto that I do before kickoff I would say that I say to myself and I like touch the grass and jump up that's something that I've been doing since yeah even before I graduated high school before every before kickoff and then uh, even before second half kickoff too you have a secret talent hmm. Not really. Um, I'm, I used to play some musical instruments, but totally forgot that. Um, I have a pretty dang good memory, I will say, and I have good like lyric recall. So I can like hear a song once or twice and like I, and you could play the song like five years later and I like know the lyrics. So I don't know if that's like a talent, but yeah, I think just my memory in general and recall is very good. Speaking on music, when I spoke with Bethany, uh she said that there is not really a team like dj at the moment no, has that no. position been filled or uh, that position? it changes i mean sometimes bethany does it's kind of like whoever gets to the locker room first and wants to i think being team dj is like so much anxiety and <laughs> nerves for me like i'm just like and i like don't have like it takes me like a year to update spotify with like the latest song like uh, Sophia does it quite a bit. Um, Z King has taken on a pretty ambitious role with it, uh, especially like if we're lifting or anything, like she always connect to the Bluetooth. But yeah, I stay away because I, for me, that's like way too much stress, especially if it's before a game. I'm like, I don't want to be like, you know, there's nothing worse than someone like, you know, people are like, this isn't pumping me up. It's just, no, I, I can't handle that. So, but I would say, yeah, I've noticed that even like Hammond has been getting on the, it's like an eye touch or something that we have connected to the locker room. Z or Sophia was even like Houston. She was like one of our team DJs. So. Do you have a go-to game day meal? No, because things like game times change. I mean, in Challenge Cup, we were having 10 a.m. games. Um, I mean, no, I, I do love pancakes. So I will say um, I'm a sucker for blueberry pancakes. They've got to be gluten-free. I've been eating gluten-free the past couple of years now. Uh, but no, I'd say like blueberry pancakes, uh, maybe some avocado toast with eggs on top. Um, but no, chi you know, chicken, I'm a big, I'm a big red eat meter. I, yeah. Red meat eater. I'm not a vegan by any means. I love like ground bison and grass fed beef. Um, so yeah, it's a little tough to eat those like right before a game, but um, no, honestly, it just kind of depends what time kickoff is really is what I would say. 
No, that definitely makes sense. I'm sure you can't, you know, eat necessarily a, a dinner meal at yeah before yeah. a 10 a.m. kickoff, you yeah. know. Um, so would you say that you're on in a, in a sort of debate versus waffles and pancakes? You're on the pancake side? Yeah. Uh-oh, you might need to debate with Bethany there because she told me that she likes waffles better. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I, mean, I have to side with her on that. I am sorry. Oh, no. No, no pancakes are like so original like mm -mm, no I mean waffles are probably like I don't know they're both pretty easy to make but I guess if you have a waffle maker they turn out like a little cooler looking but no I'm, I, I'm a pancake lover for sure I got you do you have it you don't have to necessarily pick one because this might mm -hmm. be hard but if you've got a couple do you have a favorite current soccer player Honestly, on the male side, I'm obviously going to choose like so Virgil van Dijk or Sergio Ramos. They're, you know, two of the best center backs in the world. Um, on the female side, um, I would say I, I, because I, I played with her, Viv Medema at Arsenal or in the Netherlands. Um, she was just like a baby. I think she was like 19 when I was at Bayern with her. Um, so it's been really cool to see like her progression from when she joined there to how well she's doing at Arsenal and with the Netherlands. Um, and then even like, I mean, total fangirling, like Becky Sauerbrunn, like I think since I, trained, you know, started playing center back, like it's just been like, um, I mean, I think we are different type of players, but I think the composure and that consistency that she just emulates every game is um, just something that I really admire. And I'm definitely like when the national team's playing, she's someone that I'm watching. Um, and I just think she's like a very down to earth and cool person. Um, so it's really happy that she's captain and, and kind of getting, I think more and more recognition, just defenders in general. But I think um, she's been at mainstay with the U S women's national team, the best team in the world for like 10 years. Like it's about time people recognize her greatness. So definitely, Definitely. I mean, when we're playing the thorns, like I'm like, Oh, she's a nobody, like, you know, but, um, other than that, like I definitely try and watch her games and, and what she's, how she's playing. Do you have a favorite player of a player a pair of cleats to play in? Yeah, I wear the, um, so Nike, the phantom vision. Um, I did love the Magista. So was a little upset when Nike stopped making those. Um, but no, the phantom vision, it took a little bit to, you know, get used to them. Um, I do, I don't like having my laces like on the outside, like for me striking a ball, it feels weird. So I still, even though they're not like the Magista where you're supposed to like tuck them under the laces, I still find a way to do that. So it's a little weird, but uh, to me, I just feel like I can strike a ball cleaner and just, I don't like to double knot my laces either. So I think single knotting when they're on the outside is just, I'd be on the ground every 10 minutes, like tying them. So but yeah, no, they're, they're a good cleat. They're a good balance of like, uh, again, since I'm involved in a lot of tackles, like I don't feel like every time my foot gets stepped on, it's going to break, but then they're still like lightweight and not like, you know, I think like lugging me down do you have a favorite pacific northwest restaurant i mean honestly i haven't <laughs> i haven't been to any like since being back it's been just over a year now since um you know i came back from australia and really between them being closed or it being highly discouraged <laughs> that we go to them i don't i mean i've the most i've really been to um are coffee shops so big fan of olympia coffee um, and Bluebeard Coffee uh, down here for sure. Those are my two go-to. Well, uh, we're, we're getting closer towards things getting, hopefully get it better, you know, kind of taking some time, but hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll get that changed. Um, yep. Do you have a Pacific Northwest scenic site that's your favorite? Um, I mean, I do really like the view from Rattlesnake Ledge at the top. Um, and then honestly, really just I think it's cool like coming down the hill like toward our apartments toward like Point Reston and like when the ferry's out or there's always a freight ship docked so I think that's like really cool and again like I said like 
even though the water's cold, like 90% of the year, like I do love ice baths. So I, I don't have an issue when I'm like mentally prepared to be in there. But um, yeah, I just think seeing like the water, like, oh, it's like clean, like blue water. And just like that just naturally, like, even if I'm not like in the best mood, I'm like, oh, okay. I'm instantly like a little bit happier. So I think that is like a cool view, like coming down that hill and like you can see our apartments and the farmer's market and all that and then there's the ferry going on to Vashon and the freight and you can you can see Mount Rainier right on a clear day I think that's really cool when you turn the horn and walk my dog and like oh on a clear day there's the point and boat and then there's there's Mount Rainier for sure. Do you have a favorite sport to play outside of soccer? Honestly, I don't really <laughs> do other sports because I'm just like, I would hate myself if I was like just messing around and injured myself. Um, paddle boarding, I do really enjoy. I did quite a bit of that in Australia. So it's not really a sport, but it is a decent, honestly, it's a decent like full body workout, whether like my calves are sore from like gripping the board a bit or like even core workout, upper body, like um, so it, it's both like you can make it a workout or make it interesting if you want. Um, I'm definitely someone who just likes to be more chill with it and just, again, like be out on the water and, you know, try not to fall in because I was like terrified of sharks in Australia. But I did it once out here, <laughs> um, but it was like freezing and just way too, like I chose like the worst day ever to like borrow a board and do it. So that's definitely something like the summer, like May, June, July, when it's a bit warmer and I'm like, if I fall in, it's not the end of the world. Um, definitely something I'll be, I'll be looking to rent a few boards probably to just kind of relax and I think it's good recovery, um, just kind of active, but also like pretty chill, so. And then do you have a sort of favorite Seattle athlete? Ooh, um, I wouldn't say so. I mean, obviously like ton of respect for Sue Bird and, you know, that's easy, like coming from, you know, Pino and um, obviously all of the success she's had with the storm. Um, I mean, I do enjoy like watching the Seahawks I don't like really have a favorite player on them I mean I like Russell Wilson obviously I think it's I saw him actually I only went to one football game my in college and it was my entire aunt and uncle and cousins they all went to NC State and so they're huge NC State fans and so it was NC State versus Carolina at NC State and I decided to go with them. I don't know why. And Russell Wilson was playing for NC State at the time. This was before he transferred. And so I think, like, again, that was cool. Kind of be like, oh, seeing him in college before he, like, really even became big at Wisconsin, right? And then all the success he's had with the Seahawks. And I think it's cool, like, that he spends, like, a million dollars a year on all his recovery modalities and a chef and stuff. Like, I wish I could spend that money on that stuff. Um, but yeah, I just, I think Seattle sports in general, like you always know they're going to be like really, like really good. Like they're always going to be competing for championships. And um, yeah, so I think it's again, like, oh, or, and even like the Sounders, right? Like um, Jordan Morris, like I think is a really cool story. And obviously it's, you know, tragic with his second knee and, um, you know, there's Sounders, he's not on the Sounders anymore, but he was training with us, Miguel Ibarra, uh, and did a lot of pickup with us during quarantine and all that, and so that was really, like, cool to kind of have, you know, that experience with someone of that caliber, but you always know, like, it's, like, a standard that I think standards, uh, Seattle sports teams have, and it's, like, you don't want to be the worst of the Seattle sports team, so you, you gotta, like, you know, reach a certain level each season um, to kind of make the city proud, but no, it's, I, it's been really cool, and, um, you know, again, being a part of like a big sports city, like again, considering like there's no NBA team, right? Or they were taken away or moved or whatever tragic ending. But, right, you got that on the head. Yeah. Um, yeah so um, I but can't still, I think though, the storm are pretty damn good. Yeah. 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 So um, no, I think, you know, again, it's something that like once, you know, we're out of this mess, like, you know, going to storm games or even a Seahawks. I went to one Seahawks game, like what, six years ago or Sounders game too. So um, yeah, I was hoping 
my best friend Keely. I was hoping JJ signed with the Seahawks. I was like, that'd be so cool. Like I'd go to all the Seahawks games, but no, I just think it's a great, you know, sports city. And again, like all the teams are like quality teams that are competing for a championship every season. And I don't, I don't, I think very few cities like as a whole with all the sports teams can say that. I definitely say we're pretty lucky even to have some of the teams that we do. Cause some teams, some cities don't necessarily have, you know, say a professional mm-hmm. soccer team for women, yeah. you know, <laughs> so yeah. I'll, I'll take what I can get, you know, and even yeah. with hockey coming around, I have no knowledge of hockey. All I know is yeah. the puck goes yeah, in. Yeah, I don't know anything either. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my extent of knowledge right now, but yeah. um, I really want to thank you for your time. Again, like I said, I am grateful for any opportunity I get. Um, and obviously I can't go and bug anybody at the games for autographs right now. I'm excited to go down there. Um, and just, you know, see things in person. Cause for me, at least seeing things and seeing these games in person is always different. I, I know that I've heard from some people that they prefer being at home, but if I get the chance to go to a game, I'm always going to the game instead of watching it at home. So, um, I want to thank you for your time. Um, I do want to ask, I have before my weekly episodes, I have, uh, Taylor Rapp was uh, a Washington Husky here and I got him to uh, do uh, like a sort of intro. Would you want to do part of an intro that I I could include uh, in the weekly episodes? Sure. Yeah. All I need you to say is, you know, your name and your position and team and just say that you're listening to the Circling Seattle Sports Podcast. That's kind of a tongue twister. I've realized that. Circling Seattle Sports Podcast. I've been saying it for too long. So I guess I'm used to it by now, but I'm I'm realizing now that it might be a little bit of a, the words sound kind of funny sometimes when you put them all together. Okay. Good. Go. Yeah. Okay. I'm Amber Brooks, a defender for the OL Reign, and I'm listening to the Circling Seattle Sports Podcast. That is absolutely perfect. Thank you again so much for your time. And like I said, really excited to get back uh, to seeing things in person because, you know, me just sitting here in the room and watching these games, it's, like I said, I've always, I'll always take watching um, things in person. I appreciate, you know, your viewpoints on some of these things that we talked about because, you know, I, I'm, I'm always wanting to learn, you know, because obviously I'm, you know, not a woman. So hearing that perspective on how we can better things, you know, is it's, I'll always take that opportunity to learn. So I want to thank you again for your time. Is there anything that you want to put out there, Instagram, Twitter, I'll, I'll link it down in the description. No, nah, I mean, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. I appreciate you, you know, having me on. I know there's tons of players on our team, you know, lots of, you know, quality players and hopefully you can interview more and more of us, get our, you know, stories and our perspective out there. Like you said, it's, it's not always glamorous, these, you know, interviews or conversations, but you know, they're, they're important and it's important that, you know, the masses can hear them as best as possible. So thank you for doing your part. Appreciate it. I want to thank you and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Awesome. Thank you.